This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. The Brugada syndrome is a challenging clinical scenario because sometimes we get EKGs that aren't even Brugada to the ones that actually have high risk for sudden death. Risk prognostication is imperative, and that's something that we've been struggling with academic debates. This month, the featured article comes from Galicia, Spain, and I'm welcoming Dr. Moises Rodriguez Maniero. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And congratulations on your featured article in Heart Rhythm Journal. And we also have Sammy Viskin, someone that knows a thing or two about Brugada syndrome and channelopathies. Welcome, Sammy, from Tel Aviv Medical Center. So, Moises, why don't you kick off a little bit about the reason why it's so important to explore Brugada syndrome prognosis with EP studies, and particularly in women? This is a common theme in cardiology that women are always underrepresented, sometimes due to disease prevalence and incidence. But explain to us a little bit about women in Brugada syndrome and why you undertook this study. Thank you so much. So uh, despite the equal transmission of the disease, the clinical phenotype, as everybody knows, is among 10 to time, 10 times more prevalent in males than in females. So, and this disparity, I think, I think it's likely one of the most significant among well-recognized channelopathies and cardi cardiomyopathies. I think there is no any other disease where you can see so uh, a strike difference among males uh, and females. And relevantly, uh, the male majority has been commonly reported in, in major Brugada syndrome studies. And this has led that the vast majority of the predictors of cardiac death uh, have been uh, validated in, in, in population constituted by, by, by males. So this is stratification in women, as you said before, is in patients with Brugada syndrome remains challenging and there is little evidence to support the medical decision uh, up to date. And so you decide to, to call up all of your friends and get 20 centers to collaborate okay. and exactly. uh, over 19 years. Tell us a little bit about the cohort studied. Yeah, this is um, a study where we get in touch with uh, the vast majority of the EP labs in, in, in Spain and one in Portugal in order to have a, a decrease the bias because sometimes there is a lot of heterogeneity in different populations of patients with Brugada syndrome, but, but this is performed in a, a, a region in, in Spain uh, mainly and uh, by doctors with experience in the management of patients with Brugada syndrome. And they are almost all of the participant centers are EP labs. And I think one of the strengths of the paper is not only the number of patients included and the follow-up, but the fact that uh, all the patients included, they have a, a PBCP study. So we wanted to validate and um, not also the uh, electrical parameters, but uh, particularly the, the role of the EP study in this population. No? So, um, and we take that into account. Also, we take into account the genetic, uh, the result of the genetic test that was performed in not the entire cohort, but the half of the patient they underwent the, the genetic test. And we consider positive those variants uh, uh, class five or class, or class four. So I know you have one result slide for us to discuss. Why don't we pull that up and tell us what you found? Yeah. So um, I think in the slide, as you can see that during the almost uh, 12, uh, 12 years of follow-up, which is relatively long for, for, for Brigada, uh, overall 770 patients, we included uh, 178 females, I think, and of them 150 were asymptomatic. And during the follow-up, as you can see in the, in the slide, uh, there were five uh, patients that had an event uh, defined as a sudden cardiac death or an ICD shock. Uh, th three patients uh, received an ICD shock and two patients died suddenly during the night, during the sleep. And as you can see in the kaplan mayer there were no major difference uh, in those patients that uh, presented a positive or a negative uh, EP study. As you can see in the table number three, the, in the multivariate analysis only, the, the presence of atrial fibrillation of a positive genetic test, they were uh, predictors of uh, uh, adverse events as compared to male patients or the, or, or the total cohort, in where the, the spontaneous type 1 ECG pattern was a predictive of events, not in females. That is uh, something that you can see in the literature in some other papers, the, the, EP, uh, the, 
the ECG is not predictive of events, and so it is something that needs to be taken into account. And in the overall population, the AP study with one or two extra bit was also predictive of, positive, of, of adverse events and uh, the presence of syncope, but these predictors were not significant in, in females. That's wonderful. And can you, for practical purposes, teach the heart rhythm viewership how, you, how intensive you do the program stimulation? Yeah, uh, the problem with the simulation is that, 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 that although it was performed um, in a uniform manner, it was not the same in the 20 centers. Some patients, in some mm -hmm. hospitals, they performed the study from the RV Apex and from the RVOT. So, but that was not common in all the population. But in all the hospitals, they perform uh, up to uh, three patients icon length and up to three extra bits. So we'll bring in Dr. Viskin. Sammy, you've been debating this with Dr. Brigada for nearly 20 years that there really shouldn't be much of a role for EP study to guide how therapies will be delivered. This is news in a way that's concordant to what you've been saying for a very long time. Can you explain to all the electrophysiologists listening why you've always had the position that EP study really isn't a great differentiator of risk? Well, I was looking back at the papers I've written, and I found that in 2003, I wrote one paper in favor of EP studies in Brugada, <laughs> 2003, in, in JC. Uh, but already, uh, and I used to do a lot of EP studies in asymptomatic Brugada syndrome, and my problem was that everybody had, everybody had inducible VF. We were doing uh, aggressive protocols, and if you're aggressive enough, and everybody was having inducible VF. That was okay for us because we were using that in order to start quinidine therapy and then retest them again. So, so we accepted that result. Uh, by 2007, I wrote the first editorial against this. It was called, is, is asymptomatic Brugada syndrome a cardiac ticking bump? Mm -hmm. And um, I was trying to um, uh, put the notion that uh, the prognosis is not as bad. And uh, as the, the more we learn about Brugada syndrome, we learn that the prognosis is not as bad as in the original studies. And that is something that always happens in medicine. You know, when, when hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was first described, then people thought that everybody with HCM would die suddenly. And we know now that that is not the case and, and the same is true for Brugada. And so that is why at some point I thought that it, they're not useful for clinical decision-making. I mean, in every single study that you look at, patients who presented with cardiac arrest will have a higher likelihood of having inducible VF than asymptomatic patients. That, that's true in all studies. So, so the EP studies are a marker of risk but the same is true for female gender in for male gender in coronary disease, and the same is true is for for male um, male gender as a risk factor for sudden death in athletes. It's a risk factor, but you cannot use it uh, uh, as a risk prognosticator. And risk one of your points, Sammy, and your top ten reasons not to do testing in this in this journal edition is that it's still not sufficiently low enough of a risk if you have a negative EP study. Yes, so, I mean, for, for, if you look at the uh, famous meta-analysis by Srubik, and if you look at the asymptomatic patients with spontaneous type one, so if you do not do an EP study, you can tell them they have a, an annual risk of 1% per year. Now, if you do an EP study and it's positive, then the risk goes from one to 1.7% per year. And if it's negative, it goes down from one to 0.7% per year. So, I mean, so the difference is, 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 different from, is different from the statistical point of view. And you have a p-value, but from the clinical point of view, um, moving up from 1% to 1.7 or moving down from 1% to 0.7 or the difference between 0.7 per year to 1.7 per year is not, is not a difference that will allow you to really make a good decision with your paper, with your patient, sorry. 
uh, particularly because in all the studies, all the events we are counting are ICD shocks, not true sudden death, not true cardiac arrest. So we are even overestimating the value of the test because not all the patients who had VF documented and treated by a uh, defibrillator would have died otherwise. So this is the best case scenario. Uh, and the difference is not that much uh, to allow us for, for a good decision making. Those are great points. Now, M Moises, can you teach us a little bit, including me, about the distinction between Brugada pattern and asymptomatic, asymptomatic syndrome? Because I think sometimes we say, well, they just have pattern, there's no sudden death. But with your group, you feel that anyone that has a type one at any time is then labeled syndrome, is that correct? Yeah, that's it, correct. But that's not only one thing that happened in our group. I think that's uh, something that is happening in the population with Brugada syndrome. No, the, from my point of view, the, the, the presence of symptoms does not define uh, the syndrome. You know, as we were talking before. I mean, the what well, the definition of the syndrome is based on the on the ECG. If you have a type one ECG pattern, that for us, I mean, for the according to the expert consensus document, is a, a Brugada. A Brugada syndrome, and if you uh, present a positive response after a, a provocative test with asthma with, or with uh, with fleganite, you know, that's uh, the two situation where you can call it a Brugada syndrome, and not uh, according to me uh, the presence of, of symptoms. Actually, the vast majority of the patients in our sample, and also in patients with the belonging from the Brugada uh, group in Brussels, in Barcelona, and also the Sabrus register, I think. They also presented the vast majority of the patients that we are facing nowadays are completely asymptomatic. And, and, the, and, and the problem is that sometimes they can present with a sudden cardiac arrest. So, so I think we have to distinguish the, the symptoms and the, and, the, and the syndrome. And Sammy, you think we're left, there's no reason to debate syndrome versus pattern. This is what it is. Anyone I mean, with Brugada type one yeah, provoked or not has Brugada syndrome? Syndrome is the wrong word, but we stuck with it because we're for many years. We, I mean, we call patients with a um, WPW pattern. We call them asymptomatic WPW. And patients with a long QT, we call them asymptomatic long QT syndrome. So it's the wrong word, but we're stuck with it. So I, I have no problem with the notion of asymptomatic Brugada syndrome because some of them will die. A few of them will actually mm -hmm. end up dying. And for those who actually develop syndrome, I mean, for Brugada is, is not forgiving. For those who go ahead and develop syndromes, the first syndrome is very, is very likely to be a cardiac arrest. So I can live with the, with the uh, term asymptomatic Brugada syndrome. So then the question to both of you will be the million dollar question. Why is this less common in women? Is this really an ITO expression issue? Is there something about estrogen and repolarization that we know changes QT? Is there, Moises, why don't you start us off? What are some of the biological um, plausible explanations as to this difference, yeah. this striking difference? I think the, the difference uh, are based, first of all, as you said before, in the, in the different expression of ITO channels at the level of the RV uh, epicardium. No? There is a beautiful paper in 2002 by Antelevich group where they beautifully shown has uh, there were different uh, density of the IT channel and different response to terfenadine. They, they, they shown as uh, the recording of the actual potential, the phase two entry and the, uh, the conversion of a DCG to a Brugada pattern in, in males and, and not in, in, in females. Um, but I think it's not only uh, based on uh, ITO channels, but also in the hormonal influence. There is a huge uh, uh, effect of the estrogenos and testosterone uh, uh, in, the, in the outward uh, current, and, and that can be one, some of the reasons. There is also one, one thing that we found, and I, I don't have an explanation for that, is, the, is the, uh, that females present uh, almost double of the positive genetic test than, than, than males, there is no explanation for that. But also, it is really well known that there is a connection between a, a, a mutation at the level of, of the uh, sodium channels and contraction disease. And as we well know, and it's according to our results, the presence of atrial fibrillation is a marker of risk. Mm -hmm. In, in the Brugada, Petrus Brugada's group, the presence of sinus node dysfunction was also a predictor of, of, of risk. So I don't know if there is any connection between the result of the genetic test and, and conduction disease that could explain also this, 
this this this, this relationship. But there is uh, from no no other reason that I I am aware of. I don't know if Dr. Lewis maybe. Sammy, any differences um, between the sex and gender for response to quinidine? Well, I mean, we have very few women uh, receiving quinidine because we have very few women uh, with Brugada. We're always more concerned about giving quinidine to a woman because women are more likely to develop a long QT syndrome from any drug. So we try not to treat women. We try to convince them to remain untreated if they're a asymptomatic. But some of them are scared enough and they want a solution and we will not go and do an EP study. So if they want a solution, we will treat them with quinidine. This has been fantastic. From Galicia, Spain to Tel Aviv, Israel, you've taught me a lot and I wanna congratulate Moises on his Thank featured you. article. Please read and read Sammy Viskin's editorial, Top 10 Reasons. When I was a fellow, I read Top 10 Reasons Not to Do DFT Testing. It's a beautiful and healthy debate. And I wanna congratulate both of you and thank you for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs>